webinar organized by the Department of English, the Assam Royal Bengal University, which is a part of the ongoing Royal Speaker Series. Royal Global University, a premier institution of Northeast India, is dedicated towards the nurturing and overall development of its students, and amid such distressing times, is constantly innovating and proactively focusing on online pedagogy print for the benefit of the society. I feel proud to mention that GU has conducted over 50 webinars till date, encompassing a plethora of relevant issues. The recently acquired position as the top-ranked private university awarded by Education World is another feather in the cap and a small token of appreciation for such Herculean efforts. The topic of discussion for today's webinar is Literature from the Margins, and our invited speaker is Mr. Juan Garrido Salgado. Uh, we also have our respected head of the Department of English, Professor Krishna Barua Mam with us. Professor Barua is a former professor in English at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Guwahati, who has acquired her PhD from Guwahati University on Catholic College, and is also the author of two books, including her Not I, But the Wind, an anthology of poems. Uh, here, I'd request Krishna Ma'am to speak a few words on the auspicious occasion. Ma'am? Sir should speak first. Professor Singh should speak first. Okay. Uh, okay, sir. Uh -huh. uh, we also have amongst us our Honorable Vice Chancellor of Royal Global University, Professor Dr. S.P. Singh, sir, whose presence has <laughs> been a constant beacon of positivity and support throughout the webinars that has been organized by our institution. Professor Singh is a well-known academician and an administrator. Uh, he is a former lecturer in the University of Lucknow, director and vice chairman of Sherrod Group of Institute Institutions, also vice chancellor chart. of Amity University. He has joined as the vice chancellor of the Assam Royal Guru University from November 2016 and has led the university to soaring academic excellence. Sir, I would request you to address our assemblage by expressing your thoughts and bestowing your thanks to the bonus. Sir? <laughs> I was trying to, you know, fix up a few things, uh, technical. I, I'm, I'm, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are very much audible. Uh, because I was trying to fix it with the geo device also, so that okay. uh, if there is a fluctuation in between, because, you know, <clears throat> During the last almost 90 days, uh, we all are fighting and, you know, fighting with coronavirus. At the same time, we are also fighting with technology around us and we are being wired from all the sides. And I think somebody must write a book on, uh, on something which we have gone through in 90 days as a teacher, as an administrator, and also about how our life has been circled around the wires and the vibes around us. So anyways, good morning to everyone present. I just thought, let me start with that. Uh, our very, very esteemed uh, Professor Barua, uh, my other faculty colleagues and members of Royal School of Languages, other faculty colleagues from different uh, schools of Royal Global University, and Mr. Masoom, thank you so much for introducing me. And all my uh, senior members in the university who are attending this webinar, including our chairperson academics, Angira Memani, madam. <clears throat> I don't know what to say on today's occasion because uh, as a student of science, management and law, probably I read a lot, but may not be I'm reading enough for my, uh, for my knowledge or for my, for my psyche, for, my, for my, myself uh, with respect to literature, with respect to with respect to books, which I should read, and I always feel that I'm not getting enough chance in my life to read as much as I want to with respect to literature, with respect to books. But in my life, I got opportunities many, many times when I used to have a little bit more time or maybe more inclined to read. And that time I have read many books. A year back, year and a half back, I decided that I'll complete at least one book every month but that I could continue for six, seven months from last four, five months. I have not read anything. So I have not kept promise, which I have give, done to myself. My request to each and every participant here, especially student and faculty, they may be from science, they may be from any field of studies, but uh, the reading should be a habit. 
and uh, I personally say that I can't read on uh, internet. I can't read by my gadgets around me unless and until book is there in my hand in a physical form. I don't have a feel. I don't feel like I'm reading something and neither probably I'm able to grasp or understand and go in depth of what has been written by writers. So this is one part what I wanted to speak for a minute. Second man, second thing I want to discuss about or maybe tell you about that I'm very fortunate that I'm vice chancellor of uh, a very good university where I get opportunity and we have such a motivating professors and such a motivating, you know, uh, professor emeritus and eminent professors who always motivate me and who always encourage me to to speak on these occasions which is not my domain, but uh, then it becomes a little mandatory for me and also it becomes motivating for me to read a little bit topic concern. And that way I get myself more, no feel more knowledgeable and I get enriched. So thank you to all the professors and all the head of departments of pushing me to speak maybe one or two minutes. And I am very sure if your vice chancellor will learn new, new things every day, this university will probably get benefit end of the day. So during this uh, pandemic time, uh, definitely I have become more prudent, more sensitive, more knowledgeable. Yes or no, I don't know, but more aware, more concern, more uh, thinking more about people around me, thinking more about nature around me. And uh, it has I have become more to myself and I have understood whatever uh, one should do during this period of time. I was just briefly thinking about uh, something which as a business uh, st student of business management or as an individual, I think that is about profit and loss. You can say gain or loss, you can say, but even you read a book. I always feel that I don't know. I'm, I may be wrong that you read book for some gain or you read book for no gain. But I believe that everybody devote time is always expecting something to gain out of it may not be thinking that he or she is gaining it, but then end of the day, there is a gaining there. Everybody gains something out of any book you read and that should be the approach. And many times you lose once you uh, don't complete your task and you and I was thinking about during this Corona time, what you have gained, what you have lost. But then I was thinking a small thing. I don't know what is the gain you have done during this time is a loss. And what is the loss or what you are lost? during this time is again. So I, I was having a thought in my mind, what loss during this time is a gain and what gain during this time is a loss. So I don't know, this may be a topic to discuss in any other webinar, but I just tell you one physical, in physical sense on a lighter note, that uh, if you lose weight, it is a gain during this Corona time. And if you gain weight, yeah. that is a loss during this Corona time. If you gain good health, so it is a gain. But weight is something which I thought, and fortunately, I lost, and that is my gain. So I'm very, very happy to share with this you all that I keep on thinking in those lines, and probably that is because I'm more inclined for literature and I'm reading and listening to all those eminent people. So that maybe to cheer up you for the day, I thought let me cheer up you in this manner. As far as like these uh, topic is concerned, migrant writers about marginal literature, about Hispanic diaspora. Thankfully, I have been supplied some material. I have read it. I'm more knowledgeable in those areas, but I have no authority to speak on that. But then I now realize that many authors whom I have read who migrated from one place to another and started writing about marginalized people that maybe for the Dalits in this country or maybe tribal people or maybe anybody who is marginalized in any nation or maybe if you have migrated from like today's author has migrated from Chile to Australia born in 1957 she is just 10 years elder he is just 10 years elder to me and he must be having I mean I, I was going through his badata and he has done a, a milestone achieved major major milestone in the for, in the field of literature and poetry also and he's a president of Multicultural Writers Forum. So, I mean, he's a great personality. My request to each and every participant today that please be very attentive, listen to him carefully, learn whatever you best can learn from him. And many of you may not become, I would say, migrant writers or maybe marginal, but you can definitely write on the marginal side 
this is also very important if you want to see the whole picture of the society in totality you have to read all kind of literature and marginal literature gives you an insight about what is going on which is not visible in front of you many times media in other ways it is not the real picture which comes in front of you but an honest author once he write about these issues in a very systematic manner in a very interesting manner you become you reach very close to the marginalized people you understand their issues more deeply um, with more sensitivity that is the beauty of reading a book and that is the beauty when you read any book which is related to a particular topic because rest of the things are knowledge but knowledge is not enough to take your life forward and to become a good human being unless and until you have in depth knowledge and that only can be gained by reading good books novels and literature and if you do that uh, i think you will be more sensitive and prudent person uh, this is what i want to convey i am not going to you know discuss about topic that is not my domain i may be excused if i have said something which may not be correct my best wishes to all of you and thank you everyone for giving me a chance to speak on this occasion uh, over to masu Thank you so much, sir. That was truly really inspiring and a very interesting analogy. Analogy that you said about uh, gaining through losing. Uh, that's really something we should reflect upon. Uh, now I request our lovely professor Krishna Borua, ma'am, to uh, speak a few words on this auspicious occasion, ma'am. Uh, very good morning to every one of you, and especially to Masum for carrying it off so well. Right. So uh, we are really fortunate today to have with us, who will be joining us soon, Juan Garrido Salgado, who is a very well-known poet of the Latin American literature. And um, I should thank Royal Global University for offering such a opportunity for the students to meet all this. And uh, Royal uh, Global University, in many ways, I have seen open for liberal arts. And the design of the courses where we have, we have acquainted the students with what is there in world literature, especially in literature, and not only literature of the British Islands, but of the English and especially American literature, but we have cross-cultural aspects of, of uh, responses which come from all over the world. And I'm happy to say that we have a uh, course which is on cross-cultural love uh, in this. And we have many uh, books and writers which we have included in the course. Borges, for example, uh, who is from Argentina. Then we have Marquez. Then we uh, have uh, many others uh, like uh, uh, Pablo Naroda and uh, uh, Gabriela Mistral, who are, they, there's a big lineup, the literature of Latin American uh, genre, and we find that the students really love this courses, in the sense that not only do they relate to the Latin American tempo or temper of their writings, but there is something very hysteric about it, and there is something which is very we can relate to their experiences, more or less. In Neruda, especially, if you look at Neruda and uh, uh, Nobel uh, Laureate, who had his training with uh, Mistral, Gabriela Mistral, who was one of the first who got the Nobel Prize for Literature from Chile. And we find that it is not only they write in Spanish, of course, Hispanic literature, but that, that has been widely translated. And we find that there the, the, the source of words, and not only the source of words, the themes that they bring in, it brings about a complete uh, connection with what is there with nature and with existence about life and about the legacy. The legacy is so important in understanding uh, the uh, Latin American culture, because we find over there a lot of magic goes into it, a lot of emotion, which is very close to what we feel even in Indian literature. And therefore, the bondedness which is there 
between relationships, between person to person, as well as in a family or in a group or in a, in a, in a different setting together, you find that conflict comes out of that. And the convergences which come from all these conflicts which come about, ultimately you come and question about what is the meaning of existence or you go back to your past and you go back to the folk tales or the cultural ethos which is there in your tradition. So this is very beautiful in the way that we learn about those things which are there in another culture. But not only that, there are something which they especially in Neruda and also we have found in Selgada that they talk about the essential things. Especially in Neruda, we find that he goes into the basic everyday culture of everyday life. He writes about the rain, he writes about objects, he writes about eating or he writes about just an emotion which is there, nothing abstract. And from there he goes into a metaphysical idea of how you can look into the uh, way that we look at life. It is almost magic realism like we have in Marquis. And therefore in Borges, who is one of my favorites, and you find that he doesn't only talk about the legacy which is there, the Latin American legacy, but you find in his short narratives, uh, his short, uh, in his short narratives especially, you find that there is something of a compression of the whole of European culture. In one page, there is an essay, which is uh, there in the course for the students too, Borges and I, which is supposed to be a one page autobiographical statement of his own life and about his own consciousness of the entire people of his land. And you find over there in that essay itself, where he talks about the whole of European culture. In one page, we cannot think that how one can go into the entire aspects of European culture, whether it is the legacy of Shakespeare, whether it is the legacy of American authors like Poe, etc. So you find that they are taking in a different way of writing and which is a fantastic way of dealing with life's experience. And why I had told you in the beginning that uh, why we are so fortunate in doing having Salgado here because he writes about nothing at one point and then it becomes something which is meaningful. Out of nothing, he brings in something beautiful. And of course, we read them in translations, most of them in Naroda as well in Borges and Marquis. But then we find that even in the translation, the tempo of the tone of their way of life and the way that the esoteric, the magic, the emotional, the reality, the reality which we find in life, it opens up our life, a window to way how we are going to look at life. Our students, especially, I think, are benefited by this when they study in their courses, and they find that this is a literature which is something from outside, from a different world altogether, but it is so real and it is so magical and it is beautifully written especially the choice of words and the way that the experience is being said. Talking about the literature of the margins, when we talk of Aboriginal literature as such, and I am very um, happy today that our poet of the day, uh, Salgado, is in Australia. I did my uh, PhD on Patrick White, Australian experience mostly, and that deals with a lot of literature of the margins too, the Aboriginal literature, just now, Professor Singh had said about Zalit literature and things which have not been uh, done. Of course, work has been done on it, but there are things which can be uh, dealt with in more uh, systematic manner. And when we talk of literature of the margins, it is mostly dealing with songs and folk culture. And some of them are lost. As Naipaul had said, there is a loss of language. And where is this loss of language? Uh, in uh, We had an experience last February. I had written in our journal too about the boat song, about the Rafa song. One of the boatmen, he had uh, uh, sung a song while we were in the boat. We had a departmental picnic to River Kulsi. And he was singing a Rafa song and it was beautiful. 
and we asked him the meaning of the song and he said that no i do not know the meaning the songs the words in the songs have had no relevance to us we do not understand but we sing it even then and it is being carried on from generation to generation so this loss of language when you go and look into the uh, background of the song then you find that there will be the literature which is a wide spectrum of uh, experience which is there from the past and i do believe that what we are going to study today or hear from a, a poet today salgado because he will be talking about this uh, uh, aboriginal literature especially from sili as well as and we want to see how he relates it to australian aboriginal literature too. and much work can be done with that of australian literature as well as with that of chile as well as from our own tribal culture maybe right, right? so that will be beautiful in the way that they take up the kids i think that's yes, about all thank and you thank you much. so much for that and i have been just informed that uh, our speaker uh, his daughter has been help, trying to help him to connect but there has been some technical issues which is why he is yet not able to join us ma'am i would like to ask you since our topic of discussion is literature from the margins ma'am how do you see our northeast as a reason or assam as a reason and how do you relate the today's topic literature of the margins in from that perspective and any insight on that yeah because these are the very beautiful ways of looking into literature which is untapped altogether when we talk right. of literature of the margins it is something which is dealing with the orality of a tradition mm -hmm. right so the oral literature which is going on from generation to generation and how they have brought about the customs not only customs the harvesting maybe dealing with the seasonal change in the way the people worship things and this customs and everything which comes into that has been brought in a different tone and temper of right. of the of those days it is almost right. a historiographic documentation of what is going on and it is very interesting actually because in this way we uh, really look into the uh, culture of a nation of a, of a of a place not only in the way that they speak but even in the way that they uh, wrote all right not at the road because they didn't write at that time but then as the elizabethan age has been called the nest of singing birds everyone sang no one spoke all right so we may have had that nest of singing birds even in our culture yes i i, I believe we do have that because people sing and they everything that they speak of the idioms that they use the the way that they relate to things the sun the moon and the trees the way that they look at occupations like harvesting skating and rituals all these are related to the literature of the margins right and therefore even a single poem deals with so many things which are are being expressed over there right the poem right. can become a document a historical document almost of the times not only yeah. sociological but historical archaeological whatever Ma'am, and I remember you mentioned about Patrick White, and since you are the expert, you are a scholar. Uh, so, ma'am, I'd like to ask you: uh, Can we relate the works of Patrick White from the perspective of margins? No, not at all, because Patrick White was writing very much from the center. Of course, right. some of his themes were yeah, he was writing from the center, mm -hmm. and the. Uh, when he wrote the tree of men which we have in the course too he had said that i wanted to write something about a simple man i don't want to write something of great men he was one who said that the vast australian emptiness he called it the vast australian emptiness right. which had degenerated into something which is very mediocre like consumerist society like we have now we right. eat we sleep and we do not do anything else and we just gather we consume yeah so patrick quite wanted that we should write about things which are very much of a sense and this is something which pablo narada had also done even borges had done and even marquez had done talks about 
uh, everyday life and in the everyday life to find the extraordinary in the ordinary. So the three of men, I would request all our students who are there, those who have not taken the course to, but you will find the three of men is a classic. When uh, Patrick White got a Nobel Prize for Literature, it was said that he had changed the course of narration. Just, I mean, we had changed the course of narration and especially themes. And when he was asked, where is God? It was almost like the advaitic, you know, way of looking at life. In a gob of spittle, he said, this, in this gob of spittle is God. Being, the energy which is there in life, that is God. If we celebrate that, then that is where we find that. Beautiful speculative uh, fiction, Patrick White. All his books are, uh, Incidentally, when I was doing my PhD, I had the opportunity from the National Library of Canberra to go to um, Australia. But he was very eccentric at the time and he did not meet me. Uh, he would not entertain visitors. But anyway, in his land, when he talks about the land which we associate the Australian experience as something which is very you know, dealing with consumer or with long spaces, etc., with wide spaces, he brought in a different way at looking at Australia, where the space becomes a positive energy, the space right. within as well as the space outside. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, ma'am, uh, when you visited Australia, I'm pretty sure just like in our northeast, we have our indigenous languages, we have a lot of languages. Uh, most of them are yet unknown to the mainstream literary culture. So, did you find any of anything similar in Australia as well that we do not know of? Okay. Yes, uh, lots of speak? work has been done over, over there. I think Salgado will be the only one fit person to uh, talk on that. And right. uh, there is a complete genre on Aboriginal literature itself. Right? Right. And right. Work has been done on that. Especially ah. even in the Latin American sphere, right? When we talk of Chile, when we talk of uh, Juan Garrido Salgado, I think he is working as a political, of course, political activist and checkered political career goes yes, yeah. with the Latin American uh, credo. He has also <laughs> been uh, imprisoned for his political activism. Yeah, because everyone from from uh, you look at Borges, you look at. Uh, uh, Pablo Naroda, everyone had a checkered political career, right? And everyone questions and they are very emotionally charged and they tell things which are not to be told. And then ultimately they are be, become the victim of all this political activism. So this is a part which is politically very conscious and very, very emotively they are charged. And then it comes out in some of their writings too. And the mapping which he does, especially uh, uh, Naruda, when he does the mapping of territory, of the body. All right, some of his poems which talks about, many people call him very sensual in, in his early parts, of course, of his life. But in the later parts, he goes back to small things, uh, absolutely everyday things like, as I told you, rain and objects, and just like Raina Maria Rilke, in, uh, a German poet, who had brought about the object poems. The object poems means the object itself tells you everything, like the panther or a road, like we have even the haiku poems in the Japanese, huh. where a road or a cherry tree or an apple tr uh, tree, it is the object of your own introspection. So the tree itself becomes a subject of your of your looking at life, which denotes everything. So the object as it is, the thing, which is called the thing points in Rena Maria Rilke, we have to uh, in Pablo Mare. PJ Mohanto sir is there. You can ask some questions. Yes, hello, ma'am. That was a very interesting analogy. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, PJ sir has joined us as well. Uh, you can ask him. He will be the right person to ask 
uh, answer questions of literature of the margin. He has done a lot of work on that. Yeah, ma'am, but I don't, I don't see his name in the list, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the uh, unfortunately the technical issues are uh, in the side of our speaker has still not been solved. So mm -hmm. we are having to wait a little bit. And for our viewers as well, I'm extremely sorry about that. Uh, I'm pretty sure you will join us soon. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Uh, you've just talked about Australian literature. Uh, I wonder uh, whether you have already come up with uh, the works of someone like Zerad, Zeral Murnin, uh, who I believe is someone mm -hmm. who's working in a very, uh, in some areas which are quite sophisticated in terms of uh, his narratives and other things. I've read his yeah. two novels, so that's why I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah. These are new names, yes. And as I told you, this, is, this has become very rich, the legacy of Patrick White, if I call it, right? So even some of the Australians say that he's too difficult to understand. But even then, we find that he had brought in a new trend to Australian literature. Before, we thought that Australian literature dealt only with the outback about Aboriginal tribes, etc. But there was so much more to it, all right, as a culture, maybe, and maybe uh, on the speculative side or speculative fiction, we find that the whole space becomes a metaphor of the inner space. Because you find that this is a terrain which is there. As we find the terrain in um, uh, maybe some of American literature in Old Man and the Sea in Hemingway, where the terrain or the atmosphere which is created by the landscape becomes a representative of the inner mind, right? So the terrain, which is very unique in Australia, has become a core point of expression and a core point of, of literary uh, representation. So that becomes almost like a metaphor which has been used, which is full of uh, difficult terrain. And the difficult terrain itself is somewhere you find it's full of deserts at the same time. At one point, you'll find full of uh, forest. Then you will find undulating spaces. It is only space. Space becomes a metaphor in, um, it is used as a, as a trope, especially in Australian literature. So you find that space where that space becomes a vacuity or it becomes a sort of representation of what is there in men's mind. It has been well explored in Australian literature. And beautifully, it becomes speculation altogether. All right, it's speculative fiction, especially in philosophical speculative fiction. I think Australia has gone up very much, much more than in American literature. In, uh, as you said about the way that people, and everywhere there is this, uh, the, the contrast has been brought in. The mediocrity, the complete uh, democratization of values which are there in, the towns and cities, and they go back to the outback, and they go back to the villages, and there you try to find out what is the essential man. As I mentioned in the Tree of Man, Patrick White, he says to express the extraordinary in the ordinary. And this is what I think most of, of uh, uh, literature deals with when we deal with Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea, when we deal with Orhan Pamuk's uh, books, or we deal with uh, even Chinua Esibi's uh, things, uh, things Fall Apart. We find they did deal with the essence of aspect, not so much with what is dealing with uh, the abstract thinking, but where the ordinary men and women live a life which is full of wonder, which is full of meaning. And in their relation to nature or in their relation with everyone else, there is a sincerity or there is something which is beautiful, which has been brought about. And that uh, uh, way of representation of this extraordinary in, in the ordinary 
varies with writer to writer, whether it is in the spot, in the language or it is in the life that they lead. And therefore you go back to the essentials, absolutely to the essentials. Sometimes it may be very uh, physical or it may be sometimes very sensuous. Okay, that's fine. Because this is what D.H. Lawrence had said, right? That you have to know what is life at its core. Or as T.S. Eliot said, that you have to uh, really understand uh, emotions from your guts, from the fifth dimension of experience. That means when you feel, when you write, you have to write with your intestines, right? So it is like you have to see the all perspectives which go into the understanding of an experience. So this is something which most of these new writers are trying to bring in. Of course, not only the new writers, which was paved way by uh, most of the Americans, especially Jack London. And if you look into Hemingway, Steinbeck, we find that they concentrated more on language. What is the connection between the words and the experience? Suppose the word honor, as Hemingway said, honor has no connection with experience. We do not find honor anywhere. So that honor is somewhere lost. That word has lost its meaning. And when he wrote, he wrote only about, uh, uh, maybe sometimes only with fine adjectives like fine and nice, as if there were no adjectives in his uh, dictionary. But he said that other words it's very true, isn't it? When we say, how is this? I am fine. We don't say I am doing good or even doing good has become a, a sort of a cliche now, right? So adjectives have come down to the minimum. So the choice of words, which has a meaning with experience, these are the way that they are experimenting with form, with form and language. And the literature of the margins, when we talk about literature of the margins, they have a different way of experiencing. Those lost words, they must have had some connection with the experience of that time, with what they felt, with the emotions. And these lost words should have some meaning, and which is poetic, and at the same time, it should be kept and it should be continued. Why have, become, have they become lost? And this is the way that uh, studies are going on. In, uh, writers are bringing these lost, uh, lost words into their narratives. So right. we find that some of this uh, things to ponder. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we actually had a question for you. Ma'am, would you like to take that? The person asked, I do not think that's his name, but he or she asks, ma'am, how do you see the work of someone like Gerald Mornay. Pardon? On that. How do you see the work of someone like Gerald Mornay? Any insight on that now? Yeah, good, of course. But anyway, it's not for me. <laughs> I uh, find it's too experimental. All right? It's too <laughs> experimental. And then yeah. we find like in Pauls, when... Uh, ah. When students, they study Gao Xinjian, Soul Mountain, right. Right. in translation. Hmm. It's only a, a play with pronouns, as I said, he, she, they, or everything else, right? And therefore they cannot understand why only the pronouns and why not the proper names or why not the names of the, of the, of, of the narrative. And there you find that it goes back to some sort of a different way of mindset which he wants to show maybe i is in he and he is in she and he again comes in you all right so the you and i and he and she they are being exchanged all together in different alternative uh, representations of the mind so it is everywhere the multiplicity of voices which are there in narrative right so you'll find that in the uh, in the uh, maybe some of this uh, lost uh, literature of the margins because there you have voices which are very multiple the tree speaks the 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 
a road speaks, the bird speaks, the man speaks. So it is almost biblical the way that we had yesterday's um, uh, lecture. It was beautiful. And we uh, with Vanita and she said that the biblical concept of language, all right, where we used more of the, the not the proper names, all right, we used the, the, the collective noun or the man, the boy, which was used by Hemingway again in his narrative style. You go back to the past, you go back to your scriptures, if you go back to even the legacy that has been laid, then you find that the use of language becomes so beautiful, you know. And when you go into the Sanskrit language, even when they say that that term was I am there, I am that. In a one single sentence, you find that in a phrase, everything has been said about the entire Vedantic philosophy of the Upanishads. And you find that, therefore, the source of the words which was there, the minimum words, as Dhruva said, I want to express the minimum with the maximum. So with the minimum words, if you can express. So the, gone are the days where you describe things in detail. So with the complete purging of language, yes, which you find even in Neruda, you'll find in Borges. In one page, Borges and I, the essay, has talked about the whole uh, history of European civilization, not only of that, about himself, about what he is as a representative of, 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 of his uh, life. And you find that it is only the way that the choice of words, so some words which will carry meanings, implications, varying meanings, which is there. As Hemingway had used nice, nice becomes so many uh, varying meanings goes into the adjective itself, right? And a full stop even goes and gives a meaning where it is a full stop to everything. So the punctuations which are used, the fonts that are used, okay? I always tell my students, be very careful of the fonts that you are using. Be very careful of, don't make it loud. Don't use too much of capital letters. All right. When you see with the capital letters, it is loud, it is daring, right? But then when you want to write something soft, you have to make it into soft words which you are writing. And you have to find about the way that you do not explain too much. You have to show the one line itself. Like Hemingway gives in Farewell to Arms, he walks out into the rain and there is no concentration on the emotion as such, right? There is no crying, there is no melodrama like we have in our serials or in our films. When someone dies, there is so much. You, you go away from the emotions. And when you depersonalize the emotion, then the impact of the, of the uh, experience becomes more subtle and stronger. This is what the stylistic uh, trends of narratology, especially Hemingway and Steinbeck had thought about. And this is very true also in Australian literature as well as in some of the literature of the margins. Of course, in the literature of the margins, the ethnicity is very important. The ethnicity of, of uh, the original color which comes into that. All right. So how do you look at the rain? How do you look at the flowers? How do you look at the clouds? Right? What were the language that you used over there? And you find that, therefore, the original uh, influences, the tropes which are used, really bring in a lot of. Yeah. Right, ma'am, as we wait for our speaker, it seems that your lecture has been so enthralling that we are receiving a deluge of questions for you. Uh, we I have received another question for you from our colleague. Uh, Stuti Goswami ma'am, she asks, how does political activism seep into poetry or literature vis-a-vis -vis Latin American literature? How many thoughts Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, Latin American literature, political activism is a must over there. All right? They feel right. so much. All right? You see a cricket, a uh, football match, yeah. all right? It is the emotion, like we see a um, cricket match. So I told you in the beginning itself, right? that emotionally charged, we are 
our, our everything we are doing through emotion more or less so there is so much of uh, likeness or there you can compare with the way of life of india right that is why i think latin american literature is so dear to us there is so much of charm there is so much of noise too over there right? so many people talking at the same time and no one is being heard and so much of conflict so much of contradictions no one is they speak the same language right and everyone has a say and there is a lot of drama so there is always conflict and drama and lots of color there is not a dull moment at all and immersion had said over there at long time back that uh, uh, what is this you know, land where there is no festival like when he had praised india right for its festivals for its getting together all right, right. and he said that we are devoid of that color of festivals in the western uh, uh, literature especially in the way of life so therefore in australian in australian literature therefore or not australian literature we find in latin american literature latin. It, especially that experience is so beautiful yeah 100 years of solitude marquis this magic realism in its utmost right and you find all of them you know going into a different uh, where magic comes in ordinary you do not know where the magic ends where reality comes in and where reality ends and where magic comes in it is not that it is something an alternate reality it is there in your everyday life and especially in uh, there's a beautiful poem by naruda i think where he you know it is very very physical many people call it the early naruda very physical but even then you find that physicality is a part of latin american culture right so you have to have a connection with the body right so you find that the body becomes very important in american literature right and uh, in doing that you find that there is a lot of uh, uh, you know innuendos then there are a lot of implications there are a lot of divergences which come into that and this uh, connection with what is the mind and the body not so much with the mind but with the body itself right and uh, borges is beautiful and i would advise my students uh, and those who have not read borges you read borges his dream tigers and uh, and it was a shame that he had not never got he never got the nobel prize for literature but then uh, borges was something which is beautiful definitely yeah and we have another question for you uh, from chanmi ma'am and she asks hello krishna ma'am Uh, my question to you is why do migrant writers mostly write about their experiences about suppression of expression and thoughts in their native country or host country it's not clear masu what is the question yeah. yes asks, my question to you is why do migrant writers mostly write about their experiences about suppression of expression and thoughts in their native country Yeah, that's very true. When we go into the slave narratives, right? We are not talking about migrant uh, literature as such. We go into the slave uh, land narratives. All right, there. Thank there you. Was... You are in. You are in. Great, great, great. Oh, I, I think. think... Yeah. 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 Hello. Uh, hi, hi, Krishna, ma'am. <laughs> hi. I, I think our speaker has just joined. Uh, Masum, oh. you can take over. Uh, uh, who else has joined? <laughs> Yeah. One, am I am I Ishman? Am I audible to you? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Sure you are. Yeah, great, great. So, Masum, it's all over to you now. Yeah, sure. Uh, Thank you, dear. Would, would you like to? I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, hello, Juan, sir. Hello, hello. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for for the technical problem. And sir, I... sir, that's totally fine. Yep. Do you like to finish your answer, or should I move on to our speaker? Yeah, we no, should just move. Uh, uh, we should move. Sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for this this enthralling lecture. And now I would like to introduce our uh, esteemed viewers to our speaker for today's session, 
Mr. Juan Garrido Salgado. Uh, Mr. Salgado was born in Chile and has published seven books of poetry and has been widely translated. He is also a translator who has translated works into Spanish from John Kinsella, Dorothy Porter, and MTC Cronin, among others. He has been the president of the Multicultural Writers Association and also a philanthropist. Mr. Salgado has been a political prisoner under the totalitarian regime of Augusto Pinochet and was brutally tortured for his political activism and resistant literature. He immigrated to Australia from Chile in 1990, managing to escape the regime and has been living in Adelaide since. His latest book is titled Hope Blossoming in Their Age. Uh, sir, and with that, I'd like to hand over the dais to Mr. Salgado. Sir, take it away. Thank you. It's me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, uh, I, first of all, I apologize for this technical problem, but uh, I am very um, glad to join your your meeting. And uh, um, I hope we can discuss something very interesting uh, here today. And I would like to to start it with the acknowledging where we all do in Australia to say uh, I um, I make my respect to the Aboriginal people who are the present, the past and the future who are the custodian of this beautiful land in, in Australia. And I, I would like to uh, read a short poem bilingual in Spanish and in English who this poet, his name is Robbie Walker, and I, I translate him uh, in, into Spanish. And he was one of the uh, 483 people who have been died in custody. We call death in custody in Australia. So I read the poem. Comparison. Comparison. Human beings are like guitar strings. If they are not in tune to each other, the result is noise, no music. I will read the translation what I did in Spanish. Comparación. Los seres humanos somos como las guitarras. Si las cuerdas no están afinadas entre sí, el resultado solo será ruido, no música. This is a short poem where I, I think is described what happened in the world today and for, for so long time. There are so much noise, but no music, no much, no enough music. So, and the, I believe the role of the poet is to make music. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we have been getting a lot of requests to turn on your video, sir. We cannot see you actually, sir. Yep, yeah, there. Okay, sir, but it's totally fine even if you cannot do that, sir. Please continue. Sir. Yep. Okay. So, can I continue? Yes, sir, please. Yeah, well, I believe it's, uh, it's a lot noise around the world and it's not enough music. So at the role of, I believe the role of my role as a poet is to make some music through the poetry. And I, I am sure uh, you agree with me. In my experience as a poet, I have been living so much a suffering and injustice, not only myself, but a lot of my people back in Chile, when when we were uh, under the Pinochet regime in 1973. So uh, I was fully act active politically, and also uh, I have been start writing poetry 
and and I joined a street theater as well. And we did a lot of activism through the poetry and through the theater. And in some some time I wrote poetry under a student name, not with my real name. So uh, my real my name at that time as a poet and as a political activist was Samuel Laferte. And I was able at the end of the dictatorship to publish this little book of under the Samuel Laferte name. And, and but I, I suffer all the political situation of repression what happened in, in Chile at that time. And, and I was in prison eight months and I, I was tortured physically and psychologically. And I, as a, many of my friends and people, they suffer the same. So um, I really believe in, in the poetry is a vehicle of make the human being much away of what happened around the world and around the, the relationship as well. So, so that's why I, when I discover uh, this little book of, of this Aboriginal poet, I was so glad to make the, the connection between what happened in Australia with the Aboriginal people and the refugee and myself and my people back in Chile. So I arrived very, uh, with no English at all into Australia uh, because I, I only speak in Chile Spanish. Uh, but when I arrived in Chile, I was so determined to learn the language and to try to tell my story and share my story with the Australian people. And I was very fortunately to to learn quick the language and also to write my poems, and they have been published about seven books in Australia, seven books of poetry, and of uh, some of bilingual and some just in English. So I will share some time with you some of my poems what I wrote in Australia. But I am concerned about my first status as a refugee, as a political refugee in Australia, but also now as, as a new citizen of Australia, because I got the citizenship now, so I can call myself Chilean or Australian and Chilean poet. So, and, and, and that is a, a, a sort of um, a, a old way I struggle because your identity or, or your background is so strong in Latin America. And, and, and I re, re discover a new background, a, a, new, a new culture here in Australia. And, and it's connected with the Aborigines and the refugees, because in Australia, uh, it's a lot of refugee. There's a lot of refugee from all around the world. So uh, there's many languages here in Australia is speaking at home, in the school, and in, in any places in Australia. So it's great to have a, a, a multicultural society as well. But it's, it's under as well, it's under to us to, to, to learn how to live and respect the, the, different, the different culture where we belong to in Australia. And it's very difficult sometimes because we got the experience of uh, uh, people have been locked out in, in, in a detention center in Australia for a long time. And, and it's, if for a, a lot of people, we believe it's no, it's unjust. People, all people should have the opportunity to live a, as a freely in a country, not should no one should be locked out because they only they searching for a, a new home or new opportunity to live. In our case, in my case, in my family case, we we as we were accepting 
to live in Australia by the by the system, by the government, but also by the Aboriginal people. And I want to share one one of the poems what I really I, I wrote in this first collection what I published in Australia is uh, in 2005, and I wrote this poem called "I Look Like an Aboriginal." My citizenship is in my verse, but not yet on my official paper. I am a poet with never ending breath to share with my people. I have an old residency within my friend's heart. I look like an Aboriginal with a Latin American accent. I was born in Santiago. I am Moreno. I have refugee statue to live on this Aboriginal land. I look like an Aboriginal. I am not alone anymore. I have aunties, Veronica, Auntie Maggie from Nyangeri spirit. I have Uncle Louis and brother Steve and Lino and Ali. I have their spirit like a bird flying in my heart. I have their community like a pathway to ancient culture. I look like an Aboriginal. My soul is for freedom. My blood is for justice. I inhabit the dream of my mother earth. So I am really uh, concerned in, in enjoying the struggle of the Aboriginal people for a recognition because the Aboriginal people in Australia, they only um, a recognition, a constitutional recognition of in 1967. They, in 1967, there they was a, a, a vote, all the citizens in Australia, they vote for a recognition of the study of citizen of Aboriginal people, but the Aboriginal people have been living in Australia for 60,000 years. There is one of the older uh, uh, indigenous culture in the world. So I, I joined the struggle of them because uh, um, they, they, th this is their land. This is their culture, you know, and we, we should respect that and we should join. That's why it's my, this poem is, is, uh, is talking about, you know, and, and, and also the, uh, the I, I already translated some Aboriginal poets into my language, into Spanish, so the people in Latin America, they can know more about the Aboriginal language too, uh, and it's very, very rich the the aboriginal poetry very very, very beautiful too when when they join the you know the all the the ancestors in the in the land because um that is so uh, amazing land here in australia we we call australia as a country but it's a continent it's real a continent of of so many languages so many a, a community living here, but uh, that is a good thing. That is a, a very good thing for for the Aboriginal and and a lot of Australian people who respect that culture too. And but in my poetry and also in my political poetry, I think I join the 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 social justice uh, Aboriginal uh, uh, group here as well in Australia and. Um, uh, of course, the, the refugee is one of, of the issues. I have, I talk, I talk, uh, I, I, sometimes I'm very confused if I talk uh, with my voice, voice of a refugee or a citizen, because I have been living in Australia for 30 years now. And, and I believe uh, 30 years is enough time to, to, be, to belong to something, don't you? Uh, because uh, when, when I was born in Chile and, and, and I live in Chile for 33 years. So uh, I think I am enriched of, uh, of 
with my poetry and my life to live in two different culture, in Latin America or Chile, in Australia and with the Aboriginal culture. And, and, and for me, the, the literature, the literature of, of the, you know, uh, we're talking about, is just to embrace, embrace culture, not to oppress, not to make borders. I think we should be free of, of we should feel free as a poet, and as a human being to, to join any culture. And that's why it's very important for me not to never, never anymore lock up myself in a jail where I, I, I have been living in, in Chile in that time. So, um, and also I have, have the opportunity to travel around the world uh, for a while. So uh, I, I enjoy listening to all the culture and listening to all the poets. I, I just recently, last, last year, I was in, in Nicaragua, in, in Mexico, and in Cuba uh, to, for a poetic tour. And I, I read my, my, my book, one of the collection books that was published last year, this, when I was clandestine. I, I joined them because it's a bilingual book. And, and I, I, was, I got the privilege to read to the, uh, my friend and, and poet in Nicaragua and, and in Cuba and in Mexico as well. So um, I am very fortunate as a poet and as a human being after so long, after so much injustice and suffering and physical torture, I, I think I, now I, I can see my my, my new uh, fruit, my, my new sea planting deep into the soil of our Mother Earth. Hi. Sir, that was truly amazing. And I really feel you have touched on a very important topic there, how literature functions as a bridge between this political division of different cultures that we have created amongst ourselves and how literature manages to surpass that um, the political oppression that is being done on the people, the Aboriginal people. Um, mm. Shana, would you like to say anything on this? Yes, um, I would like to just to, to try to um, summarize my, my reading uh, or my talk in a, in a, in a true um, True new poem. What I I want to share with you is this is a new book. What I have uh, it just published in Australia is the hope of blossom in the ink. I don't know if you can see it properly. Yes, sir, we can. Yes, sir, we can. Yeah, that's yeah. good. So uh, I will just read a a, a, a few poems. I will, I will try to read one, not too much political. Uh, because I, I, I am very uh, lucky in Australia, I work as a gardener. So I work with the earth. I plant in, I harvest the, the fruit, the, the, the vegetable uh, for a community garden. And we, we share all the fruit and, and veggie with people in need in, in our city. So this, I, this poem, what I, I read, I'm going to read tonight is, um, is part of, of, of my work in the garden. A yellow leaf is falling from a peach tree. It is a yellow leaf in my hand, a yellow and long leaf falling in an April afternoon near my notebook. I catch it with my brush in. I draw in broken wind. It is a dry yellow, tears falling from an old branch in April. It is a yellow bowl in the language of the autumn. A yellow drop is falling to the gutter. A yellow feather of a wounded bird that spent the night talking to the shadow of the peach tree. It is a so yellow gift. 
for my age, dressing up as a butterfly lost in the atom of my poem. Just to finish, I will read another Terra Nulli. They call this poem, this short poem is called Terra Nullis. I live in the Terra Nullis by Captain Cook called Australia, or perhaps in the Utopia by John Pilger called Australia. For sure, I am citizen living in a stall land where the spirit lived for more than 60,000 years. My verse are made by paper boat. This poem are refugees on a journey, searching for a place to live. I am a broken sound, a bowel which I pronounce with the accents of resistance. I am a political prisoner on Manus Island. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. And again, I'm so sorry for all the technical problem. No, sir, that's totally wish fine. to be there anyway. I wish to be there with you and hug you and, and talk to you personally. No, that's totally fine, sir. And uh, your recitation, it was really beautiful. Sir, and I have been reading a lot of your poetry, and uh, there is this one stanza that I really, uh, that really touched my heart. And I quote, oh, we are expatriate voices, tortured birds that write poems for liberation. And I really mm -hmm. think these lines are quite apt both for today's discussion and even in our contemporary context of the pandemic and racial segregation. Sir, what are your thoughts on that? I will, I will, I will love to have that book or yeah right okay sir uh we have a question from dr yes, please. Mohanta, and she asks sir would you please say how did you manage the transgression of two lands in your poetry the what sorry don't you say it again yeah would you please say how did you manage the transgression of two lands in your poetry? Oh, yep, yep. I think uh, my poetry is, uh, I can, I, I am doing it in a way of um, to join the two lands in, in, a, in, in a paper, uh, but, but I think I have to have my heart there. And because it's my heart on the right, on the right uh, land at the moment, and was in, the, uh, in Chile as well. So for me, it's sort of easy to join the struggle of a poem because I think I, sometimes my poem is a, is a struggle. It's a struggle for make sense where you live, make sense where you come from, but don't forget your past. Right. Always, all, always uh, put it in, in present time, your past, because it still is a lot, it's a lot um, memory, precious memory who will never forget, you know? So that's sort of join between the two lines <laughs> in a poem, for me, is very important. Right. Sir, we have another question for you from your friend, Indrakshi Bhartujari, ma'am. Uh, she asks you, one, you are an encyclopedia on political unrest, political asylum, and political poetry. When would you envisage the political world, see your law, Salman Rushdie, Beruz Bukhani, Salima Nasreen, etc., being heard, shaken, and taken seriously? Mm, yeah, oh well, that's the struggle. We, we, um, we, we believe uh, in, in all you know, the people who are in lock up should be free and, and and we we make a big campaign for burak basani to to get free him because he he's one of the great boys of not only a, a refugee but also the poets around right. the world 
uh, the poet, the poet around the world, because he he got amazing experience and amazing life. But I believe whatever he he said and he write because he, as he we as Australian people we we try we are very shameful for for how the the uh, the government treat the the refugee and and also i think all poets and all writer in prison should be free right sir sir we have another question from you or for you uh, from our viewer anjan sekia and he asks you you were from a country where people like you were placed at the margin and presently live in a country where the aboriginal Australians are also the immigrants uh, and also the immigrants are fighting for their rights and repulsion of the rhetoric of the terra nullius. How do <clears throat> you deal with your own trajectory of getting citizenship from the government one uh, the one and the one hand and identifying yourself with the aboriginals or the margins who you are fighting against the government policies on the other hand. Yep. Oh well, that's very interesting question too. Um, well, I I I was uh, I was very um, worried about if I have to have my citizens one day, but because um. I would like, I, I would love to have the Aboriginal citizens or Aboriginal passport, but it's, that is a um, sort of a humble and respect from the Aboriginal people to give it to me. I can't, I can't ask them, you know, because for me, uh, that will be a valuable, valuable uh, um, documents. And I believe, I believe we should, a continuous travel for that recognition to have true passport in Australia, Aboriginal in 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 Australian, white Australian. And unfortunately, because my situation in Chile, back in Chile, was so difficult, and I didn't have for a long time my citizenship in Chile, because the 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 military they denied me that when when I went out Chile. So I was not able to 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 travel in to any way without a passport. So that's why I become Australians citizens, because the other way I couldn't travel anywhere. So that was one reason. But I my from my heart, from my heart, I believe hundred percent the Aboriginal people should have fully recognition of uh, uh, of um of citizens in australia uh, without any uh, any uh, oppression without any oppression okay. but also i think it's very difficult because in chile we're still struggling with human rights passed from from pinochet time we're still fighting for i am a still a political prisoner in Chile, the, the, I, I still, I still, um, uh, I joined the political prisoner organization, and they recognize we we have been fighting a lot. So I will never uh, renounce to this status because that is part of my life in my Thank history. You, Thank you, sir. I hope this answers this question. Uh, since we are. Uh, near the end of this webinar but still i would like to take a few more questions sir if you would permit me yeah, yeah. yes please okay sir sir our next question is from kamal kumar he asks you do you believe that memories and belongingness take a greater role in writing poetry of your genre yes yeah memory for me is so so important so so deep in into the into the um, um, into your writing. My, my writing is full of memory, full of memory. Uh, I still, I still, I got a lot um, poem to write or prose 
I, I would like to write a um, uh, novel in verse back from from my childhood to to the present time and and also it just you know 30 years ago when when we arrived here i used to use a bilingual dictionary to communicate with people so that is back in memory that's his memory so how can you i can't forget that sort of experience and i will pass to my grandchildren and to other people to to values the 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 role of the memory in, in not not only as an individual but as a community there's a lot of memory in the indigenous community as well to to value to recognize and to put in writing you know uh, or, or, or memory of community or refugee community you know so it's it's very important thank you so much sir, for like. mm. sir our next question is from kalpana mani and she asks you i thoroughly enjoyed your session sir i'd like to ask what were some of the challenges of acculturation you faced when you migrated to australia from chile and how did that impact your writing uh yeah yeah that's um uh the the incarceration or the the time in prison was really really difficult <laughs> but but uh give me a lot of poems right. give me a lot of poems and uh, i am very lucky to to have this this experience in books so uh, um i think poetry sometimes is a uh, or, or life life in self sometimes uh, is a gift it's a gift you have to do something for that with, with this gift you can make a poem you can make a um a, you know a good friendship a, a, a picture or whatever or art or, or a good relationship so uh, i think my life i i think now is a gift right definitely sir sir i'd like to take one last question and mm -hmm. that is from alfiza ahmed and she asks you it is said that the poets from conflict zones often come up with fictionalized realities what's your take on this oh yeah oh well why not <laughs> Why not? I think um, some some time uh, depend how much um, good that you have in your in your life. Sometimes you have to uh, uh, have the opportunity to to fly away from reality and and put some some uh, some creation in a different way. But that's depend of 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 your of your values. That depends on your geopolitical view, and it is completely uh, acceptable, I think. Right, sir. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Um, with that, we have neared the end of our webinar, and I'd like to ask uh, our respected professor, Krishna Borwaman, if she would uh, like to give us an insight or her closing comments on today's webinar. Hello. Thanks. Thank you and uh, welcome, Salagado, sir, for being here. It is a great honor that you had accepted our invitation. It was a pleasure listening to you. I really loved your poem, A Yellow Leaf, and which is the love for life that you had shown. This is so close to what Patrick White had written in The Tree of Men. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It is absolutely about the essence of life. This yeah. uh, memory comes into ultimately the gob of spittle. And it yep. is so close to that. I did yeah. my PhD on Patrick White. So yeah. I thought that absolutely. most of it, <laughs> most of it, what you have said was absolutely about uh, what 
the ordinary man, a farmer. And when you said that you took delight in gardening, okay. that was almost like Stan Parker in the Tree of Man. Yep, yes. yep. Yeah, I, I actually I am I am reading at the moment a Patrick White books called Boss. Boss, Boss? Yes. about yeah. the explorer. The yeah, the, the Germany explorer. Yeah, and I fascinated with with his poetical language. You know, I, I will read the the tree, the Manus tree. You know, so uh, I got a, I got all the sorry. And you would really love it. In Boss too, yeah, it is yeah. almost like you have written about memory. Yes, it yes. It's full yes. of poetry. Yeah, it's and my new, this is my, Patrick Why started in my new sort of um, project. <laughs> it's in you. All right. What I found that in your, when you read your poems, it was almost like what Patrick White had written about the sense of life. Right? Yep. I think yep. you are... Uh, this, this love for life, the celebration mm. of life, which you have mm. put in your poems, there Thank is you. no lamentation. I don't find any lamentation in your poems. Thank and you so much. so much. There is no regret to. You are everywhere full of life. And I think Thank this you. is where memory makes such a beautiful experience. I think you have carved a niche for yourself. Where Thank you. you. Have put <laughs> put two cultures, the Latin American and the Australian together. And I yeah. think you'll be unique in that. Thank you so much for being here with us. And we would love to work with you about the literature of the margins. We have many such here in a SAM too, untapped uh, sources of knowledge, alternate knowledge, where memory plays a, a great part where mm. we do not know the meaning of the words which has come up in songs. Well, and thank you. We will, we will work upon that. It was a I will, uh, yeah. I will, I will love to, 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 um, to send to you um, my collection of poems and, oh, and, and my books. Uh, it's my will be my pleasure. And thank you for mentioning Patrick Why because I think I discovered him as a as a great writer. Actually, he is he's all poetry. His fiction yep. is all poetry. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. Every line is a poem. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that beautiful insight. And sir, you have delivered such a great lecture that uh, our chat box is flooding with praise saying that it was a great session. All of us have learned so much. Uh, and with that, uh, we have arrived near the end of our webinar. So here, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Vice Chancellor of Royal Global University, Professor Dr. S.P. Singh, sir, for being his dynamic self throughout the webinar. Uh, Chairperson Academic, Professor Alakuma Gulagumai, sir, for perennially guiding and inspiring us. Registrar Madam Andhra Miami for her assistance in organizing the webinar. The lovely Professor Krishna Borua Madam for being her pure self and speaking so proficiently. Our most learned audience and my esteemed colleague. And my heartiest gratitude goes out to you, sir, our speaker, Mr. Juan Garido Salgado, for such an amazing presentation. My special Thank you. Thanks from my side to Stuti Ma'am, Pranami Ma'am. Aishman sir and Chandi ma'am for guiding me constantly during my preparation for the webinar. And lastly, mm -hmm. I wish everyone a pleasant day ahead. Goodbye and stay safe. Namaste. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you.